Good afternoon and welcome to the final masterclass as part of the 2023 Family Business Summit with me, Paul Andrews, your host, and my guest this afternoon, Kristin Keffler from the US. Kristin, good afternoon. Thank you, Paul. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm really excited to be talking to you about all things next generation. Um, let's start by a little bit of an introduction into who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a um, I'm a consultant who's been working with family enterprise and with affluent families. So families that maybe have don't have an active operating company anymore, but have collective assets. Um, and I've been working in the space for about twenty years. I um, I come to this work from a really sort of heartful place in my own journey. Um, when I was 18, my father, who had always been a successful C-suite executive, always building companies inside companies, um, decided that he wanted to take his best bet on himself and he remortgaged our house and um, went to market with, with his idea. And he built a company that by the time I was getting ready to graduate from college, he had taken public. Um, had a second public offering and then sold it. And that all happened right in my early 20s. And um, and it kickstarted for me a really interesting time that that ultimately informed the path that I that I um, followed um, professionally. But there was a lot of um, for me, I felt I felt very my lived experience as a G2 didn't really like kickstart until my 20s right my dad had always been successful but and in that I just paid no attention to money but also there was no like family business that I was looking at as a kid thinking oh I might be there someday my dad was just a successful executive in other people's companies and um and so I didn't have the growing up experience of being in a family enterprise the way that most of my clients do that Many of the people listening or the or the advisors listening in um, will, will be able to relate to. I didn't have that. Um, and so what what kickstarted for me was a lot of um, need for outward learning, like, well, I don't understand the language of trust in the states. I don't understand the language of, of complex financial invest, investing. Um, I don't understand how families make decisions together about joint assets. And there was like zero landscape in my head around that. And then there was this, this internal experience that um, I really only understood in retrospect, which was this identity experience of like, well, who am I? And if if my dad is capable of this thing, that's kind of a Midas touch kind of um, moment. And that's what success looks like in my family. How do I like, is what I wanna do just like going and getting a job, is it good enough? Like, you know, if I never have a, a big financial windfall and create something really significant that is um, that I could take to market and say it, sell, like, is that good enough? And so there was there was a lot for me around like growing up in the shadow of a wealth creator and really trying to find my own identity and my own voice. And at the same time, learning the skills I needed to learn to be at the decision making table of my family. And um, so in all of that, ultimately, that led to the. So the work that I do where um, today I have the joy of getting to work with enterprising families and um, affluent families, really working on the human capital. So all of my focus of my work is on human capital within families. So leadership development, decision making, governance, um, communication, like how do you create individual thriving? How do you click create collective thriving? Um, and my heart as someone who who um, has identified as a rising gen or an ex-gen, my heart really is always kind of in that space with the client families I work with. Like, how do we really focus on um, and understand the lived experience of a rising gen that, that is both very blessed and also has some unique tripwires? And um, how, as a family, can we create space for the growth and learning of all family members and the room for rising gen to grow up individuate, find their own path, their own voice, and still be a part of the, the bigger family system. So um, that brings me to to this conversation today. A fantastic, it's a fantastic history you've got there in terms of being brought up in that, that, that environment to see such success. Um, and then almost, I guess, I, I guess the word imposter would have been, been, been something in your head at some point along the line. But, but I was talking to a few people this week about imposter syndrome for next gen, and how that causes an awful lot of angst at an early stage. How do how do you, how do you bring that up into a conversation, Kristen, in terms of 
that that whole challenge for G2, G3 or G4. And I guess the multi-generational business, the longer it goes on, the more of that there is in, in the next gen's head. Oh, I, it, it's so it's so true. And I, um, you know, one of the sometimes it's it's helpful just to be able to name it. Right. Just to name like this is this may not be your experience, but for a lot of for a lot of next gens, it is their experience and that they have this sense of like, well, maybe I'm not good enough. Or maybe if I if I tr if I go really put all of my everything that I feel like I have to offer as you know, today to, at, at this point in my life today, if I go and I put that on the table and it's it's shown as not good enough or I or I have an idea that fails or I push for something that doesn't work like how it hurts it it like there's a deep that one there's a big fear around that and two there's a deep wound of like oh maybe maybe I'm not made of the same fabric that that those in my family who have come before me are and um and the truth is that like one, everybody's gifted differently, right? We And we, not everybody is wired or interested to work in the family business in a way that actually aligns with their natural gifts and skills and the things that they most want to contribute in the world. So there's, there's that. And I think that very often, and this can be helpful. Um, I, I find this is often very helpful to the rising gen I work with to be, to be able to name for them that they're comparing themselves generally against either parents or grandparents, great grandparents who have decades more life experience than they do. And if you knew and could like go back in the time machine and see those grandparents or parents back when they were 22 or 25, they would also be questioning. They would like try and be figure out how to build their own identity capital. They would, they might be struggling that it might look actually very similar to the way that it looks for the rising gen themselves, but they have that they're comparing themselves as a 20 year old or a 25 year old or a 30 year old to somebody who has decades more experience. And it's an unfair comparison because our twenties particularly are all about building identity capital and understanding ourselves separate from our family of origin. Like that's the, that's the developmental challenge of that decade. That's a really good point, actually. And I think it's something I guess the next gens may not always think about because they always want to be that person now and they're always striving to fulfill their, their best potential now to compete and they're competing against their, their siblings, their peers, um, but also trying to emulate something they think they should be rather than actually being maybe who they who they actually are. Yeah, yeah. I You know, I remember um, from my own experience, I remember a time, a moment that I was just coming out of graduate school. My, my first set of graduate degrees, I... I have an um, undergraduate in biochem, and I, I went back soon after and got a dual degree in public health, MPH, and an MBA um, combined degree. And I was coming out of graduate school, and I was at this phase of like, okay, well, now I need to like figure out what like what's the next path on my career. And at that time, my dad came to me and he said, "We're thinking about starting a private family foundation. Um, would you be interested in being the executive director?" And I I didn't know what a private foundation I mean I understood the language but I was like I don't know exactly what that does we didn't have one you know growing up I didn't engage in that kind of um activity growing up um I didn't know what an executive director really did it sounded like they're probably someone at the top of the totem pole like, I didn't know what qualifications one would need for that I didn't know what kind of salary one would take for something like that um I, you go down the line I knew nothing about it and I remember the first thought in my head was like well, sure, if I don't have to get a job, right? Like, cause that was the phase I was at. Like, I have to go like put myself out there and, and have someone employ me. And um, I'm so grateful that ultimately the timing for that stuff in my family didn't line up. And I we never really took it further than that one conversation. And I'm so grateful because I think about, like it's those kind of moments where like I, I had to go prove myself to myself in my own career path and I was grateful for that because the easy, easy slash very hard thing would have been to end up in a situation where I was working for my family in a job I was not qualified to do that I didn't understand. And that really would have been a setup for me to, to really flounder, right? Like I needed to go like build some skill and understand before I could have ever come back to fulfill that kind of role. For your own, for your own self-development your own self-worth right 
Yep. Like there's, and I, and I, I work with a lot of rising gen and that, and that doesn't always have to be the formula, right? The formula doesn't have to be go out, be employed by somebody else, but you know, cut your teeth someplace else. And it can be a really effective formula to start to build this sense of like, oh, wait a minute, somebody would hire me on my own merit. I, I got promoted on my own merit. I'm earning income based on what I bring to the table. Like there's this external validation that can start to build a sense of confidence that like, oh, it's not just because of my last name or I'm a part of this lineage. And like I said, it doesn't have, like this isn't a, you know, a formula that, that one has to follow because there's lots of rising gen who I work with who are find themselves in the, in their businesses, um, in their family businesses, but it, it can have more tripwires in, you know, if you're inside your family's ecosystem, it can take a little longer to figure out like, oh yeah, I really, I bring value, not because of my lineage, but because of who I am, what I bring to the table. It's about the individual finding their own path, isn't it? And I, I guess the conversations I've had with people like you over the years, there's there's no one size fits all and it's, it's, it's not prescriptive. And that's the challenge because people want a book. They almost want the book to come off the shelf so they can open the chapter that tells them what to do. And it, it's, it has to come from within, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think there's useful, I mean, it's useful to have to have the books and to talk to the to peers who have, you know, been on the path. Like I can imagine for me, if I had had a peer or two or a peer group to be able to talk to in my 20s, I probably could have integrated what was happening. I would have understood the landscape faster because I like there was just truly no map for me to to try to place myself in like, well, what do I need to learn? Why am I struggling with this internally? Like what, you know, having a peer group can be helpful or consultant or a book. And to your point, Paul, like ultimately there's not a formula. And, and the work is really about like, how do we as families create enough psychological safety that family members can, can be vulnerable and worried about like whether they are contributors, what they have to bring to the table. Like they can bring themselves to those conversations in a family and be able to get good feedback and guidance, whether it's through a family office or through an executive team or through the family council or, or whatnot. Um, and it's, it's heartful work, right? It's, it's not for the faint of heart. No, it's, it's true. And I think we're going to jump around a lot because you're you're giving me lots of things to, to take on board and to use, which is fantastic. So do you think the successful families that are, and maybe some of the larger ones that have got more professional structures and more frameworks, the ones that can take a next gen on board and maybe on board them the same as they would other people in a, I mean, I'm talking about businesses, sort of 100, 200, 200 staff. Do you think the next gen have got more chance of finding their feet and finding that acceptance earlier because of the structures that are in place? Is, 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 are there tools that would help that process in a family firm? That's a great question. I think that, um, I think potentially yes. And I think that regardless of, of size of kind of like, you know, a, a big family office or, a, or, a, you know, the family office sort of embedded in a, in a family firm kind of thing, like regardless of sort of the massiveness of that, the, I think a key differentiator that makes a huge difference to how well rising gen do in that ecosystem is if the, the family office and the family themselves are both learning entities, right? So like in order to really be I mean, I, and by that, I mean, like, have a culture of learning and that adaptation and a willingness to, like, be in sort of the synergistic loop of a learning family needs to be supported by a learning family office, a family office that's willing to think about how do we onboard rising gen and, and married ins and people coming of age in the family? Like, how do we onboard them well? What do they need to know? And to not only focus on financial skills, which is sort of historically where we've hung our hats is like, okay, well, if if these rising gen have good financial skills, then they can handle what it's going to take to be in a financial family. And that's like part of the puzzle. And, you know, obviously um, you're experiencing my bias in this, which is that um, I absolutely believe in the, the need and the power of, of good, strong, grounded financial skills. And I think that in a vacuum of 
of individual skill and development and a sense of identity and a sense of self, like those financial skills are like, they're not a great place to hang them in the lived experience of the rising gen. And, and a family office has a, has a, um, or a well-designed executive team of a family firm that is really focused on leadership development of rising gen family members um, will do, they, they can do that if they're empowered by the family to do that, right. To really sort of bring rising gen into the um, ecosystem that a, that a business may have the HR leadership development um, kind of ecosystem that may already exist for employees that they can bring rising gen into and with a lens of learning and support can really create a powerful experience. Yeah. And from, from your experience in terms of that, that kind of education piece for the, the, the rising gen or the next gen coming through, is there, an, is there an appropriate age to start that education? Does it need to start at teenage or can it, does it start, I mean, we all know conversations take place around the, the dining table at Christmas dinner and everything else, but is there an ideal age to start throwing some of that stuff in? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> and this is sort of one of those yes and no questions in that it it absolutely is essential that we start having conversations in in the moments and the times that it's really clear that our kids are like asking and leaning in and asking questions. And while I think that, I mean, there's some wonderful curricula out there that that um, are are mapped for age and stage appropriate learning. Um, that I think are really useful to lean on. And I will say as a parent who has, who is embedded in this work and so thinks about it a lot, I, um, when I look at my, my youngest daughter, who's just about 11, and I think about, say, just take financial skills. I think about like what the, the sort of standard um, curriculum out there would say about where she should be in terms of her money skills. Um, she's not, she's not like on par with that curriculum, but it's also, she has just not shown an interest. And every time I try to like, you know, have her play with money or like, you know, she has money, say a savings account at the bank. Like it's, it's just not in her nature. And now, and just now I'm starting to see her wake up to be interested to how much things cost. And if she wanted to buy a this or a that, how much would she need to earn? And so I'm, I feel like I'm just meeting her where she's at. And, and it's, she's more interested. I'm not forcing it on her. So to that, that's my own experience. And I look, as I look at families, I see something similar where it's like the really successful families who do this really well, I think, have both a framework for making sure there are opportunities for the family at large at, you know, family meetings, maybe to have age appropriate learning available and to, to give autonomy to each family branch to really trust that those parents know their kids and that they will continue to lean into those conversations when they see that their kids are hungry for them rather than saying like, well, every five-year-old should have a share, save, spend, right? Like the, the, that's a really incredible um, way to, to a tangible way to get kids started with understanding money in different kind, you know, how money can be used in different ways. And some kids like that's, their heads aren't there. So why force that on them until they're ready and, and leaning in is my opinion. Yeah, I think that's good advice. That's, it's, it's really good advice. And in terms of the family narrative, I mean, you, you, you obviously watched your father grow and, and, and sell the business, but if you were sort of second, third generation family business with next gens coming through, how important is it that that heritage, that history, that whole backstory is communicated through the next gen in a way that is non-biased? Oh man, I think... I, well, I, you you just said two really important things, and one is the the importance of the the family narrative, and the other is in the non biased. And I think um, I think it's so so powerful. One, we're we're creatures. Humans are creatures that love story, right? And we we love knowing that we're a part of something, a tribe that has continuity and lineage, and um, and stories are a wonderful equalizer in that one of the things that can happen is that when we have a family lineage story, the version of the story that very often gets told is the version from the predominant family, right? The, the family that owns the business or has the wealth, but there's always people marrying into that family who bring their own lineage and their own um, 
even if it's not financial wealth that in any way matches the the financially predominant family, they have they have family stories and and family values and things that are additive to the to that predominant family story. And I think that stories give us a chance to to talk about that and to really celebrate the not only the the family narrative that's sort of the predominant one, but also the married ends and all they bring and the the, the interesting things that are in, in that past. And I think that it's important to be able to do that in a way that doesn't just celebrate the the wins of the wealth creator or right like we we already kind of hold these people up on high because of what they have done um which is you know always remarkable in some way or another and it's helpful for families to know of the stories of the times that they struggled or the times that they that like they didn't know if, if they were going to make it and they had to go out and remortgage this or do you know it's like knowing hearing those stories so it's it's the unbiased part of like let's not just have the golden narrative but let's have like the full narrative because that gives family members the rising gen particularly a space to realize like when they're struggling maybe they're not so different from their father or grandfather that they hold up with such high regard yeah you're, you're right it tends to be all the positives and, and not some of the negatives or some of the challenges that get passed passed down um, right. and one of the one of the things I think is fantastic is when they capture it in a book. So you capture some of the conversations with previous generations or now digitally. So that they're there in an archive for, for the future. So they're going to help next gens and next gens to come understand yeah. where they come from be, beyond the time they can actually even see for themselves or remember. So it's really important, isn't it, to capture that narrative? I, I really do think so. And it's so grounding. I think the further, you know, you think about it like a G2 who generally saw the G1 do what they did so they have this sort of like appreciation in some way for probably what it took to get there and the g3 may get stories of that g1 because they hopefully they're still alive and and have the chance to see and experience that but then by the time you get down to a g4 you're like unless someone is actively holding that that family story holding the family stories and making sure they get passed on this the origin story can get watered down or sort of lost and then what you're left with is what you can see which is more about um what more about social status and and maybe material gain and those kinds of things and then we shouldn't be surprised when that's what family members kind of attach themselves to because if they don't have a sense of that story what else do you have to attach yourself to yeah, no, I, I completely understand. So, what are the biggest challenges do you think facing the next generation? So, sort of the generation come into a family. What are the what are the what are the, the the triggers? What are the what are the challenges? And then, what are the things that can be done to try and mitigate some of the, those challenges? Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think that um, you know one of the things that so uh, one one reference because I I'll talk about some of the things I think are sort of um, really common tripwires. And for anybody who's interested in, in diving in a little more deeply, um, I published a book last year called The Myth of the Silver Spoon. I have it here. So this is like, if this kind of information is something that has you leaning in, I think that the, um, the book actually unpacks a lot more and really sort of gives context to, um, well, why are there unique tripwires for rising gen raised in um, enterprising families? and and how what are some of the, what what are some of the ways to like move forward through that to be to find one's own voice and and impact um but for for now some of the the top um elements that i see really commonly one of them is this idea that um it is when you come from a, a financially significant family that maybe has a business and a, and a predominant name in your community it is it is far more difficult than you would think to to actually find your own identity, um, you know, a sense of self that is separate from your big last name, a sense of self that is separate from the status you may have in the community that you were raised in, because people know that you're a family member who owns this significant business. And um, and as I said a little bit ago, we also know that one of the most important thing things for someone to do, particularly in their 20s, is when it really sort of comes home to roost. But any point in life that one can do this um, is good. To be able to find the sense of like, who am I? 
as an individual? How do I, how am I both like my family of origin and how am I different from my family of origin? And, and understanding that is what gives people autonomy and choice about how much do I want to connect with and how much do I want to be separate from my family? And so that tripwire is one, it's very common. And two, the, the, the antidote that I think is really sort of most helpful is to have a family norm and the support for, for teenagers and 20 somethings to really go build identity capital, which is a, a psychological, um, term and a term that's come out of the psychological sciences, developmental sciences to really, I, um, capture this idea of like, it's, identity capital is all the 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 gifts and skills and experiences it's the coffee shop job it's the you know i was the janitor at the library job it's the like here's all the things i did to understand who i was in the world and and what you know where my unique value was and sometimes it was just like i, I it was just the job i had or it was just the volunteering i did so identity capital <clears throat> going out into the world and doing all sorts of things that help you understand who you are including assessments and, you know, like personality assessments and skill assessments, all of those things help you understand who you are as just a human being. And when you have that clear grounded sense of who you are, then you can figure out how to be both connected to your family and how to create a life separate from, which is just an important part of, of lifetime development is figuring out like, you know, how do I cleave from my family and move to a, a fa my a new family that I'm creating and be both hold both? Um, so that that's one thing that I think is uh, one common tripwire. Another common tripwire, and I, I talked about this a little bit ago as well, is like this bar of success for so many rising gen. What they see as the as success is a bar that has been set so high, so much higher than for most people where. Um, where when they look up, they, you know, they might consider, you know, being a professional. My, my version of the story was like, I was like, a, you know, I was graduating from graduate school. I graduated with honors. I was like an intelligent person that really wanted to go find my path and was committed to, to doing good work in the world. And my, the bar of success was so high that I had a lot of question about whether that was good enough. And I think about on the relative scale in most any other family, there would have been no question that just reaching those hallmarks would have been good enough. And so really recognizing that, that in financially significant families and where there's active family enterprise and a lot of community engagement and employment and that kind of thing, that, um, that the more someone can, an individual, a rising gen can really cultivate um, a couple of character strengths that I think are, are really valuable. One of them is, is having a growth mindset so you recognize like, okay, I'm, I'm in a situation that's unusual. That bar of success is really high. Maybe, maybe someday I will do something like that. Maybe that's not my path. Um, you know, maybe building financial success isn't my path, but being an engaged, active person who has a sense of, of validity, like a sense that the world is saying like, yeah, we value your contribution. You matter. That's really important. And having a growth mindset, so the ability to um, the, the ability to challenge yourself, take feedback, learn to to be sort of willing to take calculated risks. That's all a part of a growth mindset, and this recognition that like everybody stumbles on the path to success. Everybody. That's what that's part of what the path to success is. So stumbling doesn't mean you weren't cut, you know, made of the right fabric. It means you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Um, and the other character strength that I think is really, that is kind of goes hand in hand with growth mindset is that a grit and, and grit is for many people know it's, it's very well studied. Angela Duckworth is, um, the most notable researcher in this space. And she has defined grit as passion and perseverance for a long-term goal. So rising gen, the more that they can learn that they are gritty, capable people that they don't have to, you know, that wealth can be a buffer, um, reputation, fam family reputation can be a buffer that makes it so you don't have to like sort of engage with the, the tough things in life um, to the extent that maybe your other, your peers do. 
recognizing that one, you, you are leaning into challenge and integrating and learning and really employing a growth mindset. And two, that you are willing and able to stick to something long enough to really start to experience a sense of mastery around it. Those two things together are like, every, like it's the formula that, uh, that a rising gen needs in order to really be able to feel like they can rise up and define success for themselves, regardless of how hard that, that how high that bar was set. Yeah, and I guess, I guess that success then, once they've got to that stage, that success may be within the family business and it may be outside. Totally. I I watch I watch some of the um, rising gen that I work with in really significant businesses, like multi-billion dollar, multi-generational, privately held businesses, like big, big entities. And I see the path that various um, clients have taken and watch how with the right kind of mindset and clarity of a willingness to work, a willingness to learn, a, a willingness to want to earn it, that that a rising gen inside their own family business where their name is the name on the building can can really craft a path that they feel like I I, I have earned it. I, you know, I've, I've built my place here. And and those who really struggle are the ones that haven't yet adopted that sense of like, I really want to earn it. I want to, I want to show that, that not only can I work, I'm willing to work maybe even harder. Maybe I, I know that I have to actually show up even better than other people in order to, to really sort of have this, have, have the sense of having earned it and earned the respect of my respect of my colleagues. <clears throat> and so I think that so much of that, like, there absolutely is a path to success. It's it's a lot about how the rising gen is wired and what their what their sort of commitment to their self and their own self growth is. And I guess that's the that's the rub, isn't it? In a way, because if you're not a confident next generation next gen member, or you haven't quite got your place or got that grit and got that energy, then that whole building up to a potential role in the business and walking in on day one and being the person with the same name as the business, that's a big thing to have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, who of us wouldn't kind of like feel a little, a little yeah. heavy under that burden and, but feel like we, you know, you can't even show that vulnerability. Like I put myself in that situation, right. And I wasn't in that situation. Like the, the business was sold. There was not a family business for me to work in. I, so I think about those that I have worked with. I put myself in that situation. And I think if I was in that situation, I would feel both terrified and like questioning like do I really belong here you know do I belong at this management level or do I belong in the c-suite and um and feeling also like I could never show that kind of vulnerability I'm gonna have to show that I like I have it all together because look my family members are all successful and it's like that is not a great setup for learning and growth and humility and success no, it, 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 it's true. So, so I guess if you've got an extern that's developed the right skills to go into the business, so let's assume they've walked in on, on, on day one, what are the best ways that they can be onboarded in terms of onboarded, um, taken on board, taken into the business? What, how do you see that process working to give them and the business the best chance of it's succeeding for, for, for both parties? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that is a great question. And I, you know, again, it's like family culture, business culture, all have to be taken into account. Um, but if we could sort of have the great equalizer, in my experience, there's like, there's a couple of important things. Like you you hear, you certainly hear of the families who say like, yep, you start in the, you start in the mail room and you work your way up. And I can, I can see that, I can see the logic in that. Um, I think that if I really look at like the rising gen I know who, typically, you know, have MBAs and MFAs and like, you know, they've gone and they've done the work and they are educated and another company would hire them and not in the mailroom, right? Another company would hire them at, at a level appropriate and commensurate with their education and their skill. And I think that when I think about family businesses, it's like, there there's two things I think that need to be recognized and, and acknowledged. And one of them is the acknowledgement that like it is a unique situation to be a family member and and most families 
really want to have at least a couple of family members working in the business. Like those, the families I consult with, they are, they're bereft if they, if they don't have a next gen or two who are really legitimately interested, because the question then becomes, well, are we eventually going to get sold? Are we going to sell this because we don't have family involvement? And so I think that the acknowledging both what are the, the legitimate skills like, so take, take the family member's name off their, off their resume, right? And just say like, what are the legitimate skills? And do we have a role, a real role for this person that we would hire somebody else into? And, and does this person have the skills to get hired into that role? Like that, that's a legitimizing part of the path for a rising gen to feel like I, I really belong here. Like there is a marketing role. I am, I have that skill set. I belong here. It's not a made up special projects role. Right. I think that's one thing. And then and then the other is to also recognize that it is unique to be a family member and that sometimes and I know this, you know, this could be a little um, heretical for for some family business consultants might really disagree with me. But I think that the reality is that family members, while while we don't want to give them a, a, you know, a bunch of special treatment that makes them feel like. And them and everybody else go say like, wow, they don't really belong here. There is some deference. I think we, we need to make at least openly have the conversation that like, yeah, as a family member, we are actively committed to your growth and development into a leadership role in some way that, that sustains us for the future. Just being able to acknowledge that, not to give them special promotions or put them in to leadership positions above what they are, what they have earned, but to acknowledge that like, we do want family members here and we want family members succeeding. So we, as you know, the executive team or whoever it is are going to be focused on how, like, if you show up with grit and growth mindset and the commitment to work, we're going to show up and continue to give you growth opportunities and, and let you keep growing. I think that that's helpful. So it's like the both and like, does this person have legitimate skill and education to be in a role that we we need to hire for? And two, can we also acknowledge that there are probably some unique circumstances because they are a family member? It's interesting you say that. I've met two next gens in the past year. I just went on road trip visits around the country here in the UK and both applied for jobs with different names. And they used different names to get through to the final round. And, and one of them said, I had to think and knock on my dad's door and say, by the way, I'm in the final three. And he had no idea. And they didn't want to share that because they wanted to do it on their own merit. And they wanted yep. to get the job because they had the credibility and ability to do it. And, and they, they both of them did get the job and they deserved to get the job, I think, in terms of the whole process. But it's interesting you say you've got to make the process work. And ultimately, the family's going to work together and it could be a win-win if they work on the same growth path. Yeah, I love it. And I, I think... What the, the stories you just told of, of two people sort of uh, going through the interviewing process under another name, like I say, hooray, like good for them for recognizing, like, I, I don't want to have any question about when I made it to the final three, I want there to be no question from, from me or anybody else as to why I made it to the final three and like, good for them. And what, what was interesting as well, Kristen, is it actually then came out that this is the fourth, fifth generation business. And so this is the fifth generation that just got the job there. Um, the fourth gen did the same. So, did the same. It. so it's the same family. And, and whether that's the pattern they're going to use going forward or not, I, I don't know. But I just thought it was really interesting that the next gen now have just followed in the steps of their father to do the same thing to get that job on merit. So. There's, a, there's a, a cultural piece there that, that one sounds like it's working if they're into the fourth and fifth generation. And um, and I can see why, right? Like there's such a, there's something that is so important. It's that I, identity capital piece we are talking about, the sense of like, I earn this on my, on my own merit. Um, and, and no, like really knowing that is like, it gives huge confidence. Yeah, I think you're right. You, you can see it and you can see it when you see them, they have an air about them. They're really happy. They love their job. They're good at what they do. But, but there's no question, I don't think there's any question in their minds that they're capable of doing it and they've been given that accreditation right from the start. And, and getting that to that stage, I think, is is uh, is really go. Um, I have no idea why I just had balloons go behind <laughs> me. That was super bizarre. <laughs> I guess it's a celebration. 
celebrating the end of a global family business now, and I have to mention your dog, who's adorable, by the way, in the background, it keeps tossing and turning, which is quite amusing. Um, Isn't she awesome? Thank you. I'm glad she could join us today. She's sort of a staple in my office. If you could give it, give some advice, I guess, to, to, to the rising gen in terms of the things they should be thinking, even before they consider a role in the business, what sort of things should they be doing? I don't know, the ages 13, 14, 15, 16, early teens, late teens, to get ready in their own, to get into a position where they can make a proper decision. What do you think they should be doing? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. Like the teenager, I think so much of it, I'm, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, um, but so much of it is really like getting a grounded sense of self like this. So, you know, one of the, the core um, developmental um, challenges or opportunities in one's teen years, really from like, like preteen through teenage years is relationships, right? Like any parent listening to this will, will be able to nod and go like, oh, right. Like when they were like, nine and younger like I was the most important person in their world and then like they they turned 10 and they their friends started becoming more important and by the time they were 16 I hardly saw them because their friends were way more important than me and I think that for one of the things that is um that's heartbreakingly common when I talk to rising gen is how the more aware they become of who they are in their community, what that, you know, what their name means in the community, the more they are, they question whether the people, the friends they have in their lives, the people they're dating are really in it for them, whether that relationship is true and authentic and, um, or whether there's a little bit of like, oh, like, you're a fun person to be a friend with. You have the best house and the greatest toys and you go on fun vacations and I get to go. And, um, and so I think that, you know, there's always the, the importance of, um, if one is, thinks they might be interested in, in the family business, there's always important things to figure out, like, when and how could I, you know, do an internship? Um, what, what do I need to know about the business that we're in? What, what basic financial skills, personal financial skills do I need to have? There's all that stuff. And, um, and I think, super important, but often not as talked about as those other elements is um, really paying attention to how do I feel in relationship? Do I feel like I can openly talk to my parents about when I'm struggling with something, a social situation or a situation where I don't know, quite know how to thread the needle because, you know, the privilege that we have and, um, you know, sort of the influence we have versus the social situation I'm in and being really being really self-reflective about the quality of relationships. Like, are there people that you have in your life that you just know, or like, those are my people and they, they would be in it with me regardless. And the more we have that sense of true authentic relationship, the more the foundation for our own ability to take risks, to grow, to learn, to try that internship, to like, it's that, that safe home base of relationship that eventually grows into you know, solid friendship group, and also the ability to discern a really good partner, a really good mate for your life. Um, under having that helps all those other skills that one would need in order to be successful in a family business. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's just really an important thing to pull back the layers and say, at each stage, what does what is developmentally supposed to be happening? And how might wealth and family prominence um, create a buffer for my ability to do that? And then how can we just be very intentional in supporting that then? And I guess that's where peer groups and mentors come in to two ends of the scale, just to give you that extra dimension away from the family, but getting extra perspectives on what what's going through in your own mind um, totally. and, and validating all, all the opposite to uh, invalidating it, I guess is, is, is what I'm saying. Totally. Yep. I absolutely agree. I guess going off being just for, just before we come to come to a close, what, what gives you the what gives you the best? What makes you what gets you out of bed in the morning? What what drives you to do what you mm. do? What do you see as success as a consultant working with the next generation? Yeah, I well, first of all, I just feel um, I feel so lucky that I mean, because I could not have picked you know if I rewind twenty. 
two or 23 years, I didn't even, I didn't have an idea that this kind of work existed. And, um, and so like the idea that I could like picture this, this kind of work that is a perfect fit for what I'm passionate about, where I have some life experience, what my education and my, my training has, um, had what I find most interesting. So the things I'll go pursue and then, and then how applicable they are to families and to thriving families. Um, like, so I couldn't even imagine it. And I look, I, I look at my life today and I feel like, um, I feel super lucky and that what, what I'm really clear about what gets me out of bed in the morning is that while I am not a perfect human being on by, by any stretch, I am very committed to growth and learning and, um, and I reckon, and I do have a pretty solid sense of what attributes I bring to the, to the work that I do in the world. And I know that because I am so passionately committed to creating thriving paths and for individuals and thriving families, that when I enter a family system, there is an, the, the all boats rise in that family system. And if I have like a little ripple impact in the world, it's like my ability to help families who are in positions of a lot of power and have a lot of financial resource when they are healthier and better and communicate better, then they do better with the power that they have and the resource that they have. And so I feel like, like if I pull back the thread on that and I say, well, what gets me out of bed in the morning? It's it's like, I'm super lucky that I understand myself well enough to do, to and be plugged into work that is a really great fit for me. And, and that I realize I have, you know, the power and influence I have in my life directly is like, you know, it's re small on the world scale. But the fact that I get to work with these really significant families who are also interested and committed to, um, to really elevating their their family experience and and the business experience for family members um, means that my ripple impact can be bigger. Which I guess you've gone full circle. So you said you came up as G2 in the business, you didn't have the chance to, you're now helping obviously G2, three, four or five do, do the same. Look, my last question really for you today, and it's, it, it's more of a futuristic type question, but we live in a really uncertain world, social media and AI and everything is changing constantly. So the, the, the next generation are coming into a world that's, that's, that's literally constantly evolving day by day. Do you think it's going to get harder um, for the rising gen in the next generation and generations to come to, to be able to step in the way that we are now because of everything that's being mm -hmm. thrown at them? Wow, that's a big question. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think potentially, yes. And I think that nothing replaces human connection. It, that's my belief that nothing replaces human connection. And so will businesses get more complex and will jobs like disappear? And will the speed of decision-making get faster and faster as we turn over more to computer algorithms and less to our own, our own minds? Like those things will probably all be true. They are already all true you know, um, to, to even a greater extent than just a couple of years ago. And I think where the real power of the family in family business is, is that strong families with strong communication, a commitment to each other and a commitment to um, family impact and community impact can always hold human connection as an even higher value than technology. And in that, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity both for communities where these where family businesses reside, um, including in the world communities for, for big uh, multinationals. And I think that the room for, for next gens to come up and bring their, their new skill set, their technology filters on, on the world could actually be a great, a huge asset to a lot of family businesses in the future. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Kristen, I, I think that's a, lots and lots as always food for thought. It's a great way to end a summit week of seminars and webinars for people around the world. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm delighted we got to have this conversation. Super enjoyable. No, it's nice to see you. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Paul.